This is Ennis again. The biggest frustration I've faced in putting together these presentations is that I have more things I want to tell you than we have time. The sun would be going down and I'd still be talking. Two years ago, site director Elsa Gilbertson organized an event at Mount Independence in which we saw on the large screen portraits of men and women who were part of the history of this place. These are only a few. Those of us on the panel told stories that hopefully made these people come alive. I want you to see their faces and to think about the difficulty that students faced, whether they are in fifth grade or in AP history. These portraits appear to be of people who are totally unlike us. Their clothes and hairstyles are strange. Their expressions are mostly rigid. Did they ever smile? Well, yes, they did. Horatio Gates, who was the commander at Mount Independence in Ticonderoga in the summer and fall of 1776, was a man of contradictions. Born in England and formerly a British officer, he was the son of a housekeeper to a duke, and that duke was most certainly his biological father. Gates received a commission in the British Army thanks to connections, but could only rise so far because he himself was lower class. He'd been close enough to the aristocracy to imitate their arrogance and to resent them. Benedict Arnold referred with contempt to Gates's face of clay. I think I can see that in the portrait. But a German officer and prisoner of war thought he saw a highly spiritual face and still a lot of vitality in his whole being. Gates was ruthless in the scramble for promotion and wanted to supplant George Washington. His obscenity could be shocking. He was very popular with New England militia. Benedict Arnold was commander of the 1st Brigade on Mount Independence, which occupied the northernmost position. He was not very interested in the assignment. I doubt if he ever slept on the mount. He wanted command of the fleet and finally pushed another officer out of the way. Arnold may be the most interesting figure in the revolution. We could spend all our time together discussing him and still not agree. But I want to read two quotes into the record. The first comes from historical novelist Kenneth Roberts. He is writing in the voice of a man who in the novel Arundel made the march to Quebec. Benedict Arnold had all the qualities of a great soldier. Observation, right judgment, quickness, leadership, determination, energy, and courage, and all of them, it seemed to me, in the highest degree. This too, I must add, because it's the truth, though a truth that, that displeases many. In none of my readings have I ever learned of anyone so persecuted and disappointed and unrewarded as this same brave and gallant gentleman. But here's another quote from a petition to Congress from William Gilliland, who was founder of a town on the New York side of Lake Champlain. His life was ruined by Arnold. He wrote three years before Arnold's treason. Bursting with pride and intoxicated with power to which he ever ought to have been a stranger, but which he has art enough to obtain from you, he tyrannizes where he can. Benedict Arnold has done more injury to the American cause than all the ministerial troops. The Enemy Commander Webster's Dictionary could use Guy Carleton's portrait to illustrate the word haughty, but in other ways, he is an admirable figure. The seventh article of the Treaty of Paris, which ended the war, read, His Britannic Majesty shall, with all convenient speed, withdraw all his armies, without causing any destruction or carrying away any Negroes or other property of the American inhabitants. 
Guy Carleton met with George Washington north of New York City and simply said no. The withdrawing British rescued 3,000 men, women, and children who might have been carried into slavery. Although an aristocrat, he is part of the foundation upon which Canadian democracy rests. His statue was Lord Dorchester, stands outside Parliament in Ottawa. There was a surprising amount of diversity on Mount Independence. I don't want anyone to think I'm making light of the injustices of the age. Slavery still existed in New England. Free blacks and natives were at the edge of society, but they weren't altogether excluded. One officer from an elite Pennsylvania regiment was shocked by the New Englanders. He wrote to his wife, the miserable appearance and what is worse, the miserable behavior of the Yankees is sufficient to make one sick of the service. They are by no means fit to endure hardships. Among them, there is the strangest mixture of Negroes, Indians, and whites with old men and mere children, which together with a nasty, lousy appearance makes a most shocking spectacle. He was, of course, entirely wrong in his conclusions. Yankee regiments were slightly more egalitarian, but their contributions were enormous. The regiment I am most familiar with, Seth Warner's, sometimes called the Green Mountain Boys, had at least three black soldiers and at least two natives. Women camp followers were an important part of 18th century armies. They cooked, washed, and nursed. When Burgoyne surrendered at Saratoga and his army marched through the American lines, they were followed by 300 women. No one counted the number of children. We know far more about upper-class women, like Lady Harriet Ackland, who crossed into the American army to be with her wounded husband, and Frederica Charlotterie Dassel, wife of the German commander. Her book about Burgoyne's campaign is still good reading. On the American side, Margaret Hay, wife of the deputy commissary general, wintered at Ticonderoga. An officer living on the Mount was jealous. He imagined the ranking officers and Mrs. Hay playing cards and forming an intimate club. When she left in the spring, officers went to Lake George Landing to see her off. Too often the stories are half told. One man was arrested and tried for, quote, rushing into Corporal Joel Pringle's tent and offering abuse to Pringle's wife. He received 70 lashes on his bare back. I just finished reading a powerful book about the Vietnam War, The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien. This slide shows some of the things they carried in the revolution. I don't want to say more You've got some archaeology coming up. On a Sunday early in September 1776, Chaplain Ami Robbins made the rounds on Mount Independence, but could not pass one single tent among the soldiers, wherein there were not one or more sick. Smallpox was less of a threat by then, but men suffered from mosquito-borne illnesses, and they did not understand the cause, and what they called camp fevers. One doctor listed the dysentery, jaundice, putrid, intermitting, and bilious fevers, which proved fatal in a variety of instances. Treatments were often as bad as the disease, purge, puke, bleed, and blister. Opium and mercury were favored medicines. Camp life wasn't all disease and drudgery. There is an account of men playing ball three days in a row. But what was the game? In this illustration, they're playing wicket, a cousin of cricket. 
I wonder if they weren't playing an early form of baseball. We know boys were playing something called baseball in Pittsfield, Massachusetts in 1791. Here's the foundation of an officer's house in the 3rd Brigade. Based on no evidence, I like to pretend it was Colonel John Stark's house. He was commander of that brigade. From New Hampshire, he went on to be the victor at the Battle of Bennington. His grandson and biographer described him. He was a man of kindness, of wit and pleasantry, apt at a retort, and amused with a joke, though he was never known to laugh in his life. You've just spent a virtual day at the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum, so I don't need to say much here. The American fleet on the lake was built in Skanesboro, today's Whitehall, New York. Skilled shipwrights were brought from the coast, but much of the brute labor was done by men from the mount. The vessels were rigged and armed at the forts. Hundreds of the sailors in the fleet were actually soldiers drafted from the mount. You might enjoy my story about the Queen. This painting of the Battle of Valcor Island is in the Royal Collection in Windsor Castle. In order to get permission to use it in the book Strong Ground, I had to pledge not to bring Her Royal Highness or the Royal Family into disrepute. It's October 28, 1776, a little more than two weeks after the Battle of Valcour Island. The British seem to be finally attacking the Lake Champlain forts. Our friend John Trumbull described the scene. The whole summit of cleared land on both sides of the lake was crowned with redoubts and batteries, all manned with the splendid show of artillery and flags. The number of our troops under arms that day, principally, however, militia, exceeded 13,000. The British retreated north before sunset, and the invasion from Canada was over for the year. Here is the same view of the Citadel or Horseshoe Battery today. And again, we're standing at the Citadel, looking across Lake Champlain to Ticonderoga. There is a connection between Mount Independence and Washington crossing the Delaware and the victory at Trenton. After the British retreated to Canada, the remains of four New England regiments hurried south to join Washington, who was in retreat across New Jersey. They arrived in time to recross the Delaware and lead the attack at Trenton. One general wrote, General Washington made no scruple to say publicly that the remains of the Eastern regiments were the strength of his army though then their numbers were comparatively speaking small. Believe me, sir, the Yankees took Trenton before the other troops knew anything of the matter more than there was an engagement.